Hello, my name is John Gibney, and I'd like to welcome you to my review video for instructional segment one on ecosystem interactions and energy. This is for school year 2022-2023. I'm a teacher here at TASM, the American International School of Muscat. Uh, all of my videos are for free. They are not for profit. They're just meant to help students, and they can be shared likewise. Um, the images I use, I many of them I took myself, and then some of them come from Khan Academy. And all Khan Academy content is available for free to help students at khanacademy.org. Let's dive in. All right. So just remember this from the first day of school. Bio is equal to life. Life is definitely equal to wow. So therefore, by the transitive property, bio is equal to wow. There you go. All right. How are you going to use this video? Well, please pause it often and try the checks for understanding. So in class, um, oftentimes I'll ask my students, can you give an example of this? Can you discuss this with your table mates? Um, make a justification with your partner. Think, pair, share. And you should do that with this video. If you're sitting there passively just trying to take in the information, it won't be as effective as you making your own explanations and engaging in all the checks for understanding. Leave the video, go access resources that you need to practice on, right? So if you're not understanding resource petitioning, pause the video there in a different tab, go to Google Classroom and look at the activities we did on resource partitioning. Practice your explanations on friends and family members. Whenever I need to present to the faculty here at TASM or to other uh, or to students or to peers, I always practice it ahead of time. And remember, if you could teach something and you really know it, so if I could teach it and if I could say it in front of somebody else, then I really know it. That's what your family's there for. Here's my sister um, and her child and my kids, and they've been subjected to many times my explanations. Okay, don't forget your textbook. Don't sleep on it, right? So I've given you a couple of homeworks out of it where you've uh, read the text and constructed your own explanations. It's really good. It's... um. CK-12, it's constantly updated. It has videos and study guides and checks for understanding within it. It's more of like an interactive textbook than say an old uh, paper one. And so I really like it and I encourage you to use it. As you're studying for this test in this class, you should use the resources in Google Classroom like we just talked about. All the things that are posted there, such as learning targets, simulations, activities, the POGL uh, practice packets that we do. Construct your own explanations of what you learn. For example, don't just give me the book definition of carrying capacity. Give me carrying capacity in your own words. Thinking of like, how many Wadi cats are in this area? What controls um, how many of that population there are? All right, remember the forest from the trees, right? See the big picture of ecosystem relationships over tiny little details. Don't get hung up on is something an R or a K species. Try and think in the big picture of how ecology works, remove any pressure, get outside, right? That's why I put this picture of our beautiful fields here and our beautiful country that we live in. Go and uh, remember that th this is just one little assessment and it's an opportunity to celebrate your knowledge, misspelled on purpose, right? Celebrations for biology. And if you need to, we can definitely remediate and retake. So no pressure. All right, here's an overview of our course. And so I went over this with your uh, parents at Back to School Night. We're starting in ecosystems and then we'll go into Earth's atmosphere with photosynthesis and respiration, evolution that'll take us to the winter break. And then we'll get into uh, fossil evidence, plate tectonics, genetics, cells, organisms, and back to climate change and ecosystems. I really like it. It's a fun uh, model and you'll get to continue it in chemistry next year when you do the living earth through a chemical lens. Okay, constructing explanations for nom phenomena. So every day I try to have some type of little interesting thing that you're working through in class. Sometimes it was the gizmo, sometimes it's going outside and picking an organism. And so you have a phenomena, you have a, an event in the real world that you're trying to explain. And how are you trying to explain it, students? You're using the practices of science. You're asking questions. You're constructing explanations by using models and mathematics. You're planning and carrying out investigations, and you're engaging in argument from evidence. I felt like we did all these uh, this unit. We will do a lot more investigations with unit two uh, because we could just do more experiments for that one. 
think back to the white-footed mouse uh, claim evidence reasoning piece that you worked on in class. And that would use all of these as you uh, worked on explaining uh, the factors that impacted the white-footed mouse carrying capacity in the real world. All right, the first couple of days of class, we had a ton of fun together and we went over some of the most famous experiments in biology, uh, Francesco Reddy's uh, and Louis Pasteur's experiments that disprove spontaneous generation. And what happened here, you can pause the videos and describe what was the independent variable in the experiments? What was the dependent variable? What were the constants or control variables? Go ahead and pause. All right, welcome back. Hopefully you got for Francesco Reddy's experiment, the independent variable was whether or not the flies had access to the meat or, you know, the, the type of top that the container had. And I told you the story of when I evacuated from Hurricane Katrina in Louisiana and how we came back and our fridge was full of these. It was gross. The dependent variable was the growth of life on the meat. And you figured out very quickly that, right, if the flies could come and lay their eggs here, that they would hatch into maggots and into more flies. This disproved the concept that life just pops out of thin air, which was um, believed at the time. Louis Pasteur did the same thing with the swan neck flask experiment. So he boiled this broth here, and you can think of it like chicken broth or fish broth. Etc. If you leave broth out at your house on the stove, it's going to get nasty. Say you left it out overnight, it's going to get a bunch of bacteria growing in it. And so here with this curved neck flask, it limited the amount of bacteria that were able to enter and you saw a decrease or you saw no bacterial growth on the inside. So the independent variable students or what was manipulated in this experiment was whether or not the curved neck flask or an open flask uh, was used. The dependent variable or the responding variable would be the amount of bacterial growth. For both of these, some things that were kept controlled or constant, they're both terms are interchangeably used. These are all, when I think of this, I think of things that are kept the same, that keep the experiment fair. It wouldn't be fair if here you use one type of meat and here you use chicken and over here you use fish. Maybe there were uh, already some eggs on the, on the chicken or in the fish or here you use a vegetable and here you use meat. So the same type of meat, the same temperature or outside environment would have to be, would be a way to keep this experiment fair as well. Here, you can think about the same type of broth. If you put one broth that didn't have any nutrients in it, then, may, then nothing might grow in it anyway. Um, and so using the same type of broth and being in the same room, same temperature, et cetera. All right, let's go to Robert. Uh, Payne's experiment. And so Robert Payne was the one that we watched in class where he went to these tidal pools and he got rid of the starfish. So you go ahead and talk about the independent variable, dependent variables, constant control variables. And in this one, we'll add in what was the control group. Go ahead and pause the video now. Welcome back. So in this experiment, he removed the starfish. I accidentally gave that away a little bit. And so he took away this apex predator and these tidal pools. That was the independent variable. The dependent variable were the number of species left in the tidal pool after five years, or in other words, the biodiversity of the tidal pool after five years. So things that were kept constant or controlled in each experiment. Um, we'd have to say that, you know, the tidal pool couldn't be uh, subjected to new um, organisms coming in or that the, uh, you know, he couldn't do one in one place and in one, like maybe 50 kilometers away, they might have different results. So they were near each other. Um, and then the control group would be the tidal pool that was left alone, right? And a control group serves as a standard for comparison. For example, if we're trying to see which type of music hypes up our SISA swim and volleyball teams the most, Right? And if they're going to go out there and listen to hip hop or country or uh, 90s rock or maybe even classical music, we need a baseline for comparison. And that baseline would be their heart rate with no music on to serve as a standard for comparison. So his control group was a tidal pool he left alone. Well, what did Robert Payne find is um, when he removed the starfish, here you had the starfish eating all these different organisms. 
is that over time, the diversity in the system really decreased. And eventually, after five years, it just became a monoculture just of these mussels. Pause the video for a second while there's a class change. Okay, we're back after the class change. So we were going over Robert Payne's experiment here with the starfish. And we saw that when you remove them, it became a monoculture after a while. One thing that was interesting is that he conducted other experiments to remove things like the limpets or the barnacles or the chitons or the sponge. And it didn't become a monoculture. It was really only with the removal of the starfish that the whole ecosystem collapsed. So um, he said in the movie, kind of a play off of George Orwell, that all uh, animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. And so here, removing the starfish was removing what's called a keystone species. So um, what's important, what I want you to get out of that is what was the independent variable? So the independent variable was the removal of the starfish. What was the dependent variable? What responds? That would be the biodiversity in the system. Um, the control group was the tidal pool that was left alone. And so things that would be controlled each time, um, you know, would be the same location. Um, there weren't as many control variables here as in some of the other experiments that we might have looked at in class. Let's look at a graph right here um, for uh, his actual results. And so here with the control group, you know, you had around um, 17 to 20 species present and then without uh, much less. And here we could see that the independent variable is with or without the starfish and the dependent variable is going to be on the y-axis over here, the number of species present. Um, the keystone species concept is that a keystone is what holds up an arch. And so they call Pennsylvania the keystone state. So I can always remember that. And if you remove the keystone of an arch, wow, what happens to the whole thing? It comes crumbling down. As here, when we remove the starfish, uh, the muscles took over. All right, let's get going. Otherwise, this video is going to take forever, and um, I wanted to help you. So how would you set up an experiment on bean germination? You'll get to do this with uh, uh, Unit 2, and we'll get to do lots of little experiments. So go ahead and describe that to your friends. Pause the video. Unpause, an independent variable, one that I might do with the effect of different pH on bean germination. So maybe I put uh, some beans in regular distilled water, in acidic water, and in basic water to see if uh, acidity or whether or not something's an acid or a base affects the germination rate. The dependent variable would be the amount of germination. Controlled variables would be light and temperature. Right? It wouldn't be fair if I put the ones in acid in more light than the ones in a base. That would make it so we couldn't tell which uh, variable caused the result. So we need to keep all those items constant or controlled. And the control group would be the beans under normal conditions. All right, I encourage you to go back, check out the Pogel on experimental design in Google Classroom to quiz yourself on this. We spent the next couple of class periods talking about what is life and the coronavirus. So this is before diving into ecosystems. Um, as a biology teacher, I felt called to talk about the coronavirus and to go over it as we try and uh, work our way out of this pandemic. I encourage you to uh, check out the HHMI uh, Virus Explorer in more detail. You did a great job with that. You ended up doing two or three sections out of four for your choice. And also the origami lesson where you made a vaccine origami. Those are posted to classroom if you'd like to do them. All right, so is the coronavirus alive? I'm not interested in you memorizing um, all the characteristics of life. What I am interested in is for you to construct an argument around those characteristics of life for items like is the coronavirus alive? And so if we look at it, I would give these to you, right? The seven characteristics of life that we use here. It could be slightly different um, in different books, but they all kind of center around this. The idea of metabolism, interdependence, evolution, reproduction, heredity, composed of cells, and homeostasis. So you need to know kind of what each of these means. You don't have to memorize the actual term, but kind of understand what each one does and then try and provide a characteristic or an example of it. Um, if you need some help with this, you should go back to the reading that I had in Google Classroom that you did in class uh, before we got on the microscopes. Let's roll through them real quick. Metabolism be uh, burning and using uh, food for energy. 
uh, interdependence, all living things um, interact with their environment. All living uh, systems evolve over time on a population level, um, which we'll go over more in that unit. All living things are capable of reproducing and they're capable of passing on their genes and heredity. All living things are made of cells. The cell is the smallest unit that can be alive. And all living things engage in uh, the quest for homeostasis. And the quest for homeostasis, I told you about Walter Cannon, the Harvard physician who in World War I um, went to the front lines to try and save soldiers' lives. And he found that they're often dying from shock and from having uh, their blood be too acidic. And so he coined the term homeostasis later on to get their blood pH levels back to a normal uh, condition so that way that they could survive and get life-saving surgery. All right, so does the coronavirus exhibit these options? Go ahead and make an argument um, about metabolism. Pause the video, come back. Not really, right? The coronavirus is going to, it's a borrower. It uses all your stuff. It doesn't use, um, you know, it doesn't process or make its own energy um, in the form of chloroplasts, and then it doesn't use that energy in the form of mitochondria. It doesn't have those items. It doesn't need it. It just takes all of your stuff. It'd be like, somebody going into your kitchen and using all of your uh, materials. So no, it doesn't eat these donuts. Does it display interdependence? I'd say yes, right? The, the coronavirus has to interact with these ACE2 receptors to get into human cells. We can't just block these ACE2 receptors because they deal with blood pressure. So we need them. Um, so they do uh, have interdependence with their environment. Does the coronavirus evolve? Yes, for sure, right? And we've seen that with all the different variants with Omicron and Delta and different uh, BA ones and twos, et cetera. They're constantly evolving. Mutations in and of themselves are random, but natural selection is not. So mutations happen all the time in the coronavirus, especially because it's an RNA-based virus, which is more prone to mutating. And then those winners are selected for, and they're the ones that become the new variants that spread out. We got to fight them with the vaccines. Does it reproduce? Well, yes, it does reproduce, but not on its own, right? It has to use the mechanisms within your cells in order to reproduce. So it has to use um, your enzymes. It has to use your amino acids, your items that you ate to ultimately build new coronaviruses. So this is kind of a, a tricky one. Does it display heredity? For sure, right? We've sequenced the uh, coronavirus genome and it has genes for its spike protein and for the RNA on the inside and for ways to copy that RNA as well. Is it composed of cells? Well, no, right? It has to be inside of your cells. So it is an obligate intracellular parasite. So what does it mean if your mom or dad tells you that you're obligated to clean your room? But you have to do that before you can go out and do something. So this has to be within, or it's obligated, it has to do intra, which means within the cell. So in order to be, um, to reproduce or to do anything, it has to be within a cell and it's a parasite. So it's not made of cells, but it interacts with your cells. Um, and so here I put the example of a sandwich, right? It doesn't bring any of its own stuff to the party. It goes into your kitchen and it takes your tomatoes and your cheese and it makes its own sandwich. Does it display homeostasis? This is a tough one. You could um, argue about it. And the answer, I actually had to go uh, check it out at Ask a Biologist at Arizona State University. And no, they don't. They don't control their internal environment. They do not maintain their own homeostasis. Um, so this is just a good example, right? That we're all learning together. And so all diseases are disruptions to homeostasis. That's what doctors do is they try to get you back to a normal homeostatic state. Um, but the virus itself doesn't display these. So is the coronavirus alive? Well, no, probably not, but it affects living things. And um, viruses have been around for as long as life has been around on earth and have been constantly infecting bacteria and going back and forth. And over 8% of our genome comes from viruses. So they're very important to study. All right. So after we did experimental design, we after we went over the coronavirus, we finally moved in to ecology, our first unit. 
This is a big picture unit, the study of how organisms um, interact with each other and with their environment. So we live in such a beautiful country that is full of dynamic eco ecosystems and ecology interactions. I hope you're outside enjoying it. So I started off the unit by looking at the red panda um, through the Khan Academy articles and I asked you about their ecosystem and factors that affect them abiotically and biotically, et cetera. And they're just so cute. And so you did that, you crushed it. You talked about where they are and um, why they're starting to be endangered and what's going on with the red panda. So let's start reviewing everything. We have an anchoring phenomenon for our unit one. And it's these two questions. And I took them from the video with the Keystone Species and Trophic Cascades because I really just love them so much. The questions are, what determines how many species live in a given place or how large each population can grow? And we went through lessons in all these titans of ecology here. Here you see Rachel Carson, who uh, we went over for the principle of biomagnification. Here we have E.O. Wilson, who didn't let, um, he had a fish hit his eye when he was seven years old and he went blind in it, and this, this right one here, and he didn't let that stop him. And he figured out all types of things about biodiversity. Here's Robert Payne. We've already talked about his starfish experiment. Here's uh, Corinna Tarnita, who deals with a uh, complex math and like geometrical patterns and how that works in ecosystems. Here's Mangari Matai, the Nobel Prize winner from um, Africa who did the Green Belt Movement in Kenya. Just awesome stuff. And then kind of our guide through this is Sean Carroll here, a famous evolutionary biologist with um, HHMI uh, who helped with uh, some of the lessons. It didn't help, but he some of the principles are what I brought out. And we have a book of his called The Serengeti Rules in the High School Library that I strongly encourage you to check out and read. It's just fascinating. So let's do it. Oh my goodness. Check it out before you wreck it out. Here are all the vocab terms we use as we try to construct an explanation for these anchoring questions. I don't expect you to memorize each of these words. There's really no point to that. What I do want you to do is to be able to use them to make some type of argument. So you kind of inherently need to know a little bit about them, but you don't need to be, you don't have to regurgitate a definition to me. But if I give you a figure with keystone species and trophic cascades in it, then ask you to um, manipulate it or apply it, then I expect you to be able to do that. If I described an invasive species to you, I hope that you'd be able to describe how it might impact a food system. And so all of these kind of come together. Let's go ahead and see what we're trying to explain. These are pictures that you submitted through Google Classroom of ecosystems that you would like to be able to explore and that you would like to be able to decide what determines how many species live in that place or how large each population can grow. And these are your pictures. I won't say your names, um, but you will recognize yours. And they're just beautiful and they're so cool. And they're from very diverse places from India, Australia, Yellowstone National Park, and tons of them right here in Oman. In some places, I don't even know. So I can't remember where this one was from, but it's very cool. All right. So I hope that you're always wondering and not scared by that list of vocab. So these are my kids, and I want them to always wonder, to always think and ask questions, and then try and figure out answers to them. So here's my ecosystem that I'm thinking about right now is Jebel Akhtar. Um, so I had a wonderful Discover Oman trip there last year, and I went up there this fall. And I'm trying to think, you know, what determines how many species live, in, live here and how large each population can grow. All right, so let's start getting to those big picture questions by understanding some of our vocab and being able to apply it. So here's going to be a lot of slides where I'm going to ask you to stop to explain it and then check yourself. So go ahead and compare and contrast biotic and abiotic factors in ecosystems. Stop the video. Welcome back. Hopefully we got that A in biology means without, like asexual means without uh, sex, abiotic means without life. So these are factors such as air, uh, soil, salinity, temperature, light, water, um, minerals, or pH that affect um, organisms, that affect the ecosystem. And then we have biotic, things that are full of life, right? And so we interact with both of these in an ecosystem. 
Um, and so fungi, plants, other animals, protists, etc. And you compare and contrast exponential and logistic growth. So I asked you about the red pandas. I had you model it on a whiteboard. Can an elephant, something that takes forever to have a baby, show exponential growth? And here it is. So exponential growth is this J-shaped curve that there, if there's no constraints on resources, that the population will just keep growing exponentially or doubling in size each time. And so, and then as uh, if it's an organism with, that has larger litters, it can be even bigger, right? Or um, are able to birth uh, larger numbers of babies. Ultimately, every single organism on earth can display exponential growth. Some of them just take longer, like it takes humans a while to be able to um, reproduce. It takes elephants a long time. For bacteria, it only takes 20 minutes. So they can uh, have a, a steeper J-shaped curve. So every living thing, and that's what Charles Darwin famously wrote in On the Origin of Species, is that given enough time, elephants could cover the entire earth all the way up to the moon and back. But it doesn't happen that way. There aren't elephants all over the earth. And how come? Because they are constrained by the availability of resources. They are constrained by the amount of food, by the amount of abiotic factors such as water that are in an area, and by competition with other species. All those factors lead to what's called a carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is the maximum number of organisms that, can, that a area can support at that time. So the maximum number of wadi cats that can be supported here in Muscat around the school, right? And since somebody's feeding them, it has gone up. There is a larger carrying capacity than if somebody wasn't putting out food for all the cats to eat. So the carrying capacity, we could also think about fish around Fahal Island. Maybe we could specifically think about uh, the sharks. Right? If there's not anything for them to eat, the shark carrying capacity is going to go down. If there's an abundance of prey and there's no pollution, maybe the carrying capacity goes up. So carrying capacity can fluctuate. This leads to what we call an S-shaped curve or logistic growth. Um, there's some cool mathematical formulas with this, and if you're interested, you can do that in AP Biology. So everything can grow exponentially, but is ultimately constrained by resource availability and exhibits logistic growth. Carrying capacity is not static. Carrying capacity fluctuates. It can change over time depending upon many, many different factors. If you think about it, oftentimes humans are dramatically impacting carrying capacity for different species. Which was my bonus question. Oops. <laughs> All right. Can you compare and contrast R and K selected species? And here's a table to help you out. All right, hopefully you paused the video and did that. So if you were to think about yourself or to think about humans or elephants, we are K selected species. We live a long time. It takes a while for us to reach reproductive maturity. We have few uh, babies and we spend a lot of time caring for them. Our selected species are different. They are the opposite. They would be like frogs that have tadpoles and that don't provide parental care for them and just have many, many babies and hope that they make it. It doesn't mean that K is better than R or that R is better than K. They're just different types of lifestyles or life cycles to reach carrying capacity. So I would hope that if I had, if I gave you a picture of your ecosystem and if it had lots of organisms in it, that you could describe which ones might be K-selected or R-selected species. Can you describe density-dependent and density-independent factors that affect growth in an ecosystem or that affect carrying capacity for organisms? Density-dependent are going to be ones that depend upon the density of the population. In other words, it depends upon how many of that organism there are. A great example are bats. As there gets to be more and more bats in the cave, they're more likely to pass along diseases. They're also going to engage in competition for food and for mates and for water and for space. And they can, that can limit how high the bat population can grow. Density independent factors do not depend upon the population. They are external factors that have nothing to do 
with how many bass there are or how many wadi cats there are or how many fish or sharks there are for a whole island. Those would be things like natural disasters like the cyclone, uh, Shaheen that came, or habitat destruction like a fire. That has nothing to do with the number of organisms there, um, but it came and destroyed their habitat. Can you think of some um, other density independent uh, factors that could affect growth? Okay, now that you have these population growth concepts and vocab down, can you describe various factors that affected the white-footed mouse carrying capacity? Well, let's go to the actual simulation. You should go back and try this model again. You ran it. Oh, shoot. I don't have a picture of it. But when you ran it, it showed exponential growth, that J-shaped curve, and then it uh, leveled off around 39 or 40 or so. So it went from exponential to logistic growth, that s shape. And it gave you a carrying capacity about here. As you added predators, the carrying capacity decreased. As you added area, and if you took the predators away, the carrying capacity increased because now there was more space for those mice to run around and to uh, uh, live in. Um, same things with temperature and water and then co competition like chipmunks and then um, you know the initial mouse population. All those items affected the carrying capacity of the white-footed mouse. What a cool uh, simulation that uh, John Darkow's teacher made for us, or for everybody. All right, let's move on. Okay, so that's called um, population dynamics, factors that affect carrying capacity. Well, now we need to understand that you know organisms aren't by themselves in an ecosystem. And so they uh, eat things and they're eaten by things. And this makes food chains and then multiple food chains together make food webs. And so there's some underlying principles here that are interesting and important to our overarching anchoring phenomena. So go ahead and look at these questions and answer them. Pause the video. All right, we're back. So let's check it out. Can you make a food chain? And here's one that I got from Khan Academy. So these algae are eaten by the mollusk. The mollusks are eaten by this fish, is that a slimy sculpin, which is then eaten by this salmon. That is a linear food chain. The direction of the arrows represents the flow of energy. In an eco, or excuse me, in a food chain or a food web, energy is going to flow from producers to apex predators. When we combine multiple food chains together, we then get interconnectedness, which is a huge theme, one of the themes of life, uh, interdependence, and we get a food web. There are a couple of terms that you should know here. Producers are able to take sunlight and use that to make sugars and lipids and proteins that other organisms can eat. In other words, they engage in a process of photosynthesis. Primary consumers eat the primary producers. These are often called herbivores. Secondary consumers eat the primary consumers. Some secondary consumers can also eat primary producers, and those would be called omnivores. Organisms that can occupy more than one level in a food chain are called trophic omnivores. This would be, uh, well, let's finish this up. This would be a tertiary consumer, the third level, and then you could also have a quaternary consumer. It's often hard to figure out or to think of a food chain that is more than five or six levels. And I question, I challenge you, why is that? We'll go over it later on in the video. This would be trophic level number one. This would be trophic level number two. That's often confusing for students because this is a primary consumer, but it's trophic level number two. This would be trophic level number three and trophic level number four. A trophic level is just the, the level in, say, a food pyramid um, that they eat. And so here, once again, if they occupy multiple levels, they're called uh, trophic omnivores. We use this trophic terminology because it's important with what we're going to call the 10% rule coming up. Okay. Here's our food web, our fun forest one put together. 
you did the Yellowstone National Park Food Web. And if you'd like extra practice, and what I'm going to give you um, on our review day before the test, if you're watching this early, is one with Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique. That's really cool. Um, you did this. You also thought about with the owl pellet, which is why I like this picture. Um, you constructed a food chain for owls as well. So you can see one linear food chain. Well, if you put multiple of them together, you get an interconnected food web. Uh, one bit that we went over is the more connections there are, the stronger the net it is, the stronger it looks like a woven tapestry, and then therefore the stronger the ecosystem is, the more resilient it is to change. Here's the example um, from the question about how much energy is transferred from each level. So if you went here, and what are the implications for that? On average, 10% of the available energy is transferred to each level. And you all knew that. You, you crushed it in class. You've, you've done it before. But the answer is why? Or one interesting question is why? Where does, it, where does that 90% go? And if we look at his mouse, it's going to go do the mouse things. The mouse has got to run around. The mouse has got to go be a mouse. It's got to go listen to mouse music, go do Tom and Jerry things or run around. That was me joking. But the majority of that um, energy that it eats from the grass or from the primary producers is lost as heat as it does work to be alive, right? And so here is a picture of it. It's going to lose... Um, you know, a ton of it to, as it engages in what's called cellular respiration, where it's getting energy from the food it eats. Some of that will be incorporated into growth or, uh, you know, fat or muscles, and then some of it will just be pooped out. So energy transfer is usually only around 10% efficient. This naturally limits the number of um, steps in a food chain, right? If only two kilocalories out of the 20,000 kilocalories in this grass is making its way to the apex predator, this hawk up here. Well, you can't have a ton of hawks, right? To have a ton of hawks, you would need to have a ton of snakes, which we need to have a ton of mice to eat, which we need to, or um, frogs, which you need to have a ton of these insects to eat, which would need to have a huge space of uh, green stuff to eat. And since inherently the green stuff is limited in an area, think around here um, in near Muscat, it might be limited to a wadi, can only be so big. Well, it can only support so many primary consumers, only so many secondary consumers, tertiary and quaternary. So it inherently limits the number of apex predators in an area. Let's see. Okay. I think we're good. So this gives you an interesting one. Why should you be a vegetarian? Why is this much better for planet Earth? And I'll let you think about that. And it's also much better just on a health level as well. All right. That is what we call the green food web. We often think about food webs where it starts with grass and then, you know, goes up to these different organisms. Most of you all have made uh, many of those before. Well, can you describe the brown food web, right? And so the brown food web, go ahead and pause the video and do it. The brown food web starts with something that's dead. It's the cane, it's the tritus. And I showed you this Ted Ed here. And around, you know, 90% of living uh, plants end up dying eventually. They don't get eaten by something. They fall to the ground and they get become compost. Um, and it might be like a rotting log and mushrooms will grow off of it. And those mushrooms are, you know, consuming uh, sugars and items that are in that uh, detritus. And they're eaten by a mouse or they're eaten by us because we're fun guys. Or they're eaten by this pill bug. And then it's eaten by a snake, which is eaten by a bird. So we're never too far away from a brown food web. Just thinking about how detritus can be an energy source as well. This is also a great point to bring up that each food web has decomposers in it. And these decomposers, like this fungi down here or bacteria, take the dead organisms, like a dead skunk carcass that's laying around, or snakes or owls, and returns those nutrients to the soil or to the ecosystem so they can be used again. And so things like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, these elements, they cycle within a food web or within an ecosystem. 
All right. At words, fruit webs, you crushed it. Um, one, one other thing that I should mention here is that energy flows through an, a food web. It flows through an ecosystem, whereas matter or nutrients cycle. So carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, we call them chomps, the elements essential for life. They all cycle around. Inside of me might be a carbon molecule that might have been inside of a cat or might have been inside of a T-Rex at some point, right? It was definitely inside of a plant at some point. That carbon atom constantly cycles throughout an ecosystem, whereas energy flows. And so if the prior, if the input of energy from the sun were to disappear, then the ecosystem would collapse. It'd be in a lot of trouble. And there's many a dystopian novel about that as well. Can you compare and contrast the green world hypothesis and the bottom up hypothesis for why are trees green? So we watched this dynamic video in class and at the University of Michigan, the professor asked, why are these trees green? And it's not as simple as just chlorophyll or um, photosynthesis, but what happens? What, what's going on in this interplay of species? So can you do that? That was probably a pretty hard question. The green world is that the apex predators in a system or predators control the amount of herbivores and therefore keep the uh, producers green. That if they're not there, the amount of herbivores can grow unchecked and can eat through all of the producers. The bottom up hypothesis is that the availability of nutrients or the amount of plants in an area inherently limits the number of herbivores, which limits the number of consumers. Both of these are correct in uh, ecosystems, um, but we've seen a lot of evidence for the green world hypothesis. Um, and this really wasn't thought about until, um, you know, the, the 50s or 60s when they came up with it. Okay, so can you describe a trophic cascade in an ecosystem? And so here, uh, Lily uh, painted this in our room. So we have the, the otters, the urchins, and the kelp. Um, you might remember that the otters are going to eat the urchins. So this is not a food chain diagram, because in the food chain, we just draw the arrows going in the direction of energy transfer. This is just showing a relationship. So here, the otters eat urchins. So they decrease their number. The urchins, ignoring the otters, the urchins eat the kelp, so they decrease their number. But if we draw an indirect pathway between the otters and the kelp, we'll see that the otters indirectly help the kelp, right? They have a positive impact on them. You can look at it this way as well. You can think about them each individually. So otters make urchin numbers go down. If urchin numbers are down, then kelp numbers are up. So as any fisher person will tell you, um, fish and invertebrates like crabs, they like structure and they like kelp forests. And without them, there's a real decrease in the biodiversity in the system. So as found, that is really important to keep the otters there. And plus, the otters are really cute. Um, they used to be hunted for their fur, but you're not allowed to do that anymore. Let's go on to the next one. Um, this is with, uh, I believe, some bass in a uh, lake. And so the bass decreased this fish. This fish, uh, I think that's a red damselfly fish, decreases the Daphnia. Daphnia eat algae. Well, let's, um, let's try and figure out what the overall effect of the bass on the algae is. Well, if this goes down, what's going to happen to the Daphnia? The Daphnia go up, and if their number goes up, then the algae goes down. So having the bass in the lake actually helps to make the lake clear. It helps to reduce the amount of algae. Oops. So the bass have an overall net effect on the algae. Sometimes these relationships are very clear and very strong, and other times they're not as strong in an ecosystem. Um, we did these with cards, and you did them with the whiteboards, and you modeled them. And then the next day in class, we did a click and learn. So if you need more practice, once again, pause the video and go back to the Google Classroom and try those out. All right.
Can you describe what is a keystone species? So I gave it away a little bit earlier, um, but the keystone is the uh, center of this arch right here. And if you pull it out, the whole thing comes tumbling down. So this is from Bio Ninja, which I really love. You take away these sharks, right? The, the rays overpopulate and they take away a lot of the diversity of the system here with the organisms that they eat. Same thing with mountain lions. And then we did the, um, a pretty in-depth look at the wolves in Yellowstone. And you did that through an explore learning gizmo. I hope you liked it. And it dealt with cool numbers dealing with Yellowstone National Park. And this is uh, what I liked about the gizmo is that it's a true story. Right in 1995, they put the wolves back in and the wolves dramatically reduced the elk and the coyote population. But mainly by reducing the elk, the elk were really eating all the trees and plants along the river systems in Yellowstone. So it dramatically changed the riparian, that's what we call right along a river, the habitat there, um, which led to some pretty cool uh, changes in Yellowstone and brought back a lot more uh, diversity into the system, such as beavers, et cetera. All right. So um, I did go over this earlier in the course, um, and but it, here's a good chance to review it. What's a niche? And can you describe the competitive exclusion principle? Go ahead and pause the video. All right, hopefully you did. Remember, it can be pronounced niche or niche. Either one's fine. And for us, I said it's your job and your habitat. So your niche is to be a biology student at TASEM, right? Um, you could be at Salton School or BSM or ABA, but you are here at TASEM, right? That's your niche. It's your job and your habitat. It's kind of your role in an ecosystem. And the competitive exclusion principle um, by Gauss states that if you have two organisms whose niches overlap dramatically, like they have the exact same niche, then one of them is going to go extinct. They're going to exclude each other. And in this instance, P aurelia is a paramecium. P caudatum is a paramecium. And when they're growing together, P aurelia outcompeted P caudatum each time, and P caudatum would die on the petri dish. Interestingly, P caudatum is actually bigger. P aurelia is smaller. So this is another instance where we can disprove the idea that the biggest organism always wins. So that would be the competitive exclusion principle. So what happens as humans if we decrease niche size for organisms? Will we then force them to have overlapping niches? And will we be engaging the competitive exclusion principle? Um, I believe this is from Khan Academy. A niche is an ecological role or way of life, which is defined by the full set of conditions, resources, and interactions an organism makes. All right, so I just remember job and habitat. Can you compare and contrast a fundamental niche versus a realized niche? And so here's the picture we use in class. This is the Cathalamus barnacle. It's slightly smaller. And here is the Cathalamus and the Semibalanus barnacle. Um, when grown together, the Semibalanus barnacle outcompetes Cathalamus, but it always, need, always needs to have water around it. And so it lives in an area where it can be getting water with low tide as well. Cathalamus, though, can, can go without water for a while, and so it can live all the way up to the high tide line and all the way down to the uh, low tide line as well. And so the fundamental niche for Cathalamus is from high tide to low tide, but it gets outcompeted by semibalanus here, so its realized niche is this area. So I remember realized by where it really lives. Your fundamental niche could be being a high school student at any of the schools here in Muscat. Like you would do great in ABA or BSM, but we're glad that you've chosen to be at TASEM. And TASEM is your realized niche. Um, I don't think you could go to both schools, both TASEM and ABA, right? That'd be too much. All right, I asked you what's your range of tolerance for a place you wanted to live. Um, sorry, I forgot to animate this slide. So your range of tolerance, um, I, and I asked you like, what was your favorite temperature and food and uh, stuff like that and things to, um, to drink, what type of juice you like, et cetera. And so uh, the range of tolerance are abiotic factors that affect your ability to live. And so here, um, if we use uh, fish, for example, they have a preferred pH and temperature 
And if it gets to be too hot, they start to get stressed. And if it gets to be hot, too hot or, or too way too hot, they'll just die, right? Their, their proteins will cease functioning, cease working, and they'll die. Same thing if it gets too cold, they get stressed. If it gets way too cold, they die. Same thing with pH. Too basic or too acidic, they die. And so this is called a range of tolerance for an organism, which can affect how many of that species can grow in an area or where they can live. Can you describe the concept of niche partitioning? And this is just to give you a reminder is the cool one that we did with Dr. Pringle about the different organisms eating the buffalo grass in the Serengeti, the zebras, the wildebeest, and the gazelles. All right, there's a bunch of ways that we can do niche partitioning or resource partitioning, same thing. They could just occupy different areas in ecosystem, right? Like the, the flamingo could live here, um, it could live here, but it's here. And the ducks are here, and the avocets are here, oyster catchers are here, plovers are here. So that's dividing up an ecosystem, which reduces the competition between these organisms. This would be a product of evolution. It's not like they, they think like, oh, I should just be in this spot so that the duck can have this spot. But it, it happens over time. And here's the one that I really liked. So after the rains come in the Serengeti, um, say in Tanzania, the grass is going to go really tall. The zebras will come first. Their density goes up, right? And so they're going to eat the grass that's really tall, and they're going to mow it down some. They'll then move on. They're migratory animals. Then come along the wildebeest, and the wildebeest like it a little bit shorter. They like it a little more nutritious, and so they'll start eating the grass. And then uh, once they make it small enough, they'll move on, and then along come the gazelles. And the gazelles like short grass. They're, they're smaller, and uh, these really nutritious parts right here. So then the gazelle numbers go up until the grass is kind of decimated and we wait until the next big rain for the cycle to start again. Um, and that's what Dr. Pringle uh, wrote about. Now, that's pretty cool stuff right there. All right. Can you describe biodiversity and just think about yourself? Do you have a diverse uh, set of friends? Do you engage in diversity here at school? Um, go ahead and pause the video. All right. So hopefully you got life diversity or differences, right? And so ecosystem diversity is the variety of different ecosystems in an area. We have great ecosystem diversity in the country of Oman. We have mountain ecosystems. We have wadi ecosystems. We have desert ecosystems. We have ocean ecosystems. Even within the ocean, we have coral reef ecosystems. We have deep water ecosystems. All super cool stuff. Species diversity. We have a great variety of species in our country, and that's fantastic. And then genetic diversity is the variety of genes within a given species. And this comes into play more often when populations are isolated or small. For example, the Arabian leopard. We might be worrying about whether or not there's enough genetic diversity in the Arabian leopard uh, species here in Oman. Can you compare and contrast primary and secondary succession? Go ahead and pause the video. So primary succession is when new land is formed um, or bare rock is exposed. And we looked at the uh, story of Mount St. Helens, the volcano that erupted in Washington in 1980, and it wiped away all the soil, and then it eventually came back with lichens and then mosses, and then they died, and they start to make more soil and eventually uh, bushes and then flowers and plants will come back and trees and uh, other organisms. So primary succession is bare rock. Think about volcanoes or glaciers. Secondary succession is when a forest fire comes through or maybe a cyclone and it wipes out all the organisms in that area, but the soil is still left. And the soil um, then can uh, grow new plants and new seeds, et cetera. So when I teach environmental science, which is an elective here at TASEM, we go over how long it takes to make soil. And is soil really a renewable resource or is it actually a non-renewable resource because it takes so long? And so erosion of soil is a very big problem um, in the world today. And I encourage you to check out the movie Dirt about it. So here would be the wildfire for secondary succession. 
All right, ecological relationships. Can you give an example of each of the following? So hopefully you got uh, parasitism would be like a tick eating your blood or fleas and a dog. So one organism benefits and the other organism is harmed. Mutualism is everybody wins. Um, we all learn from each other. So I feel like we're in a mutualistic relationship um, or you could say uh, um, the bees and plants are a classic example. The bees get nectar from plants and then they help to pollinate or spread uh, their pollen. <clears throat> Commensalism, one benefits while one does not. So the barnacle benefits while a whale does not care. In class, I told you that some ecologists argue against the idea of commensalism. They say that there isn't truly a commensalistic relationship, that all relationships are either inherently mutualistic or parasitic. Then the idea of predation as well, and this is from your pogle where you looked at the lynx and the hare, um, is that like wolves hunt elk, right? So they're gonna decrease their numbers. Um, so, but then if the elk numbers decrease rapidly or way too much, then the wolves' numbers will decrease as well. Okay, um, biomagnification with uh, with Rachel Carson right here. Can you explain why pregnant women should not consume sushi? And so hopefully uh, you paused the video there and did it, and we can remember that DDT or mercury are what we call POPs, and POPs stand for persistently organic pollutants. These are poisons they get into fat tissues and cannot be metabolized. So they're not burned off. They stick around in the system. That's what makes them so bad. <clears throat> and so these poisons get into water from power plants or, uh, you know, dumping, et cetera. And then they build up in the algae. And so I had you roll a dice. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Shivers, for giving us the dice. And how many wound up in each algae? And then how many wound up in the zooplankton? And how many in the small fish and in the large fish? And eventually, because it keeps accumulating and they never get metabolized, the relative concentration of this poison increases in each level in the trophic pyramid here. And as it gets to the top, it gets really concentrated. And it doesn't actually kill these birds or the apex predator fish, but it can kill their babies. And with the birds, remember, it made their eggs really weak. And so here's some data showing the amount of DDT and then the eggshell thickness, right? So here, if there's not a lot of DDT, they're thicker. This be a best fit line or regression analysis. And over here, a whole lot of DDT, they get thinner. And so Rachel Carson coined that a silent spring, right? That if all the eggs were broken, there would be no baby birds to sing. And I can't think of anything that'd be more sad than that. It's just terrible. Um, and so it's the same concept with tuna or with these apex fish that um, they can bioaccumulate or biomagnify mercury or other pollutants in the water. One uh, cause for concern is that some scientists think that microplastics, like small plastic uh, particles, can also biomagnify and bioaccumulate. And so that's not good news, right? If you go to beaches and you find all these plastic bottles and remember that the bottles are getting broken down, but the plastic never really goes away. It just becomes these small um, little microplastics. And if you go right up to where the tide line comes on the beach, and if you bring in some of that sand and we put it underneath our stereoscope, we will find microplastics there. And it's just gross. <clears throat> All right, can you describe how invasive species can impact biodiversity? Well, here are the Asian carp that we looked at in class, and um, they are just everywhere, right? And they were brought here to um, eat algae here in the United States, I'm sorry. They were brought to the United States to eat algae in uh, these catfish pens, right? And then there was a flood, and of course they got out. Right? And they got into the Mississippi River, and the Mississippi River is huge, and all the tributaries are all over the place, and they've just gone everywhere. And the big thing they're trying to do right now is keep them out of the Great Lakes. And I hope they do, but it, it's going to be a tough battle, right? All it takes is a couple of them hitching a ride as small, uh, small fish on a boat that goes from, say, a river then into the Great Lakes, and it's game over. So invasive species often reproduce fast have a wide ability to eat lots of different food 
and in lack of predator in that area. They can really disrupt an ecosystem and they can really dramatically decrease the biodiversity by out-competing out -competing native species. You will get to do some research on this for your ecosystem of choice when we do the project-based assessment for this uh, unit. So we have a test and we also have a project that you'll do for ecology. Um, lionfish are a, uh, another invasive species. Um, this is it, last one. Can you compare and contrast intraspecific and interspecific competition and what outcomes from these can affect our model? So uh, this is kind of, this is pretty much just vocab stuff, but intra is a prefix that means within and inter means between. So within the species and between species. So here is within the species of lizards or within the species of bears, right? This can lead to adaptations. And so the bear that has uh, a specific adaptation, say, um, you know, uh, maybe it could be behavioral, like the ability to catch salmon or here, the lizard that has stickier um, thumbtack right here to hold onto a branch, they're more likely to survive and reproduce. So it can, this competition within a species can lead to adaptations for the species. And an interspecific competition between two species that they're competing for the same food may eventually lead to extinction. So <clears throat> as we're shrinking habitats with human developments, as you saw in our movie with uh, E.O. Wilson with the um, uh, area species uh, relationship that uh, doubling the size of an island can double the number of species on it. Or excuse me, it was 10 times larger. So um, if you looked at uh, all these islands around Cuba, that an island that was 10 times larger than another one had double the number of species on it, which is pretty cool. All right. There were some stuff that we didn't get to um, that I did last year in unit one that we will do in unit two. Um, my test this year is a little bit earlier for unit one than it was last year. Um, I found that waiting until October um, was a little rough on students as they try to figure out where they were in the class. So we will go over the biogeochemical cycles of water, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, and how those nutrients or how those uh, chemicals cycle in an ecosystem. We'll do some, ex uh, some examples with eutrophication as well. That's when a limiting nutrient such as nitrogen or phosphorus gets into a system from fertilizer runoff and can cause rapid growth of algae. So here, can you go back to our anchoring phenomena? and to these, uh, to these titans of ecology. And can you talk to these titans and say, what determines how many species live in a given place or how large each population can grow? I'm not interested in you memorizing this list. I'm interested in you being able to use it to do some claim evidence reasoning, to think about if I give you an example of a power plant is built next to your ecosystem, maybe you could describe some biomagnification. If I give you an invasive species in it, you can describe what might happen to the other ones. Maybe it knocks out the keystone species and causes a trophic cascade. That's what I'm interested in. All right. Um, you've listened to all this and you're needed. You're needed to save earth. You're needed to save biodiversity. My generation, I'm 40 years old, has not done it. My parents' generation, my dad's 70, hasn't done it either, right? And they, we need activists, teachers, doctors, lawyers, engineers, scientists, and more. And we need you to be brave and bold and to stand up and to think about what policies can make uh, life sustainable on earth and with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And you're gonna get to do, well, hopefully you get to do an interdisciplinary project on this later on. And if you look at 13, 14, or 15, they deal with lots of aspects of biodiversity. And if you're upset or mad that my generation and um, the, my, my dad's generation hasn't done it, you should be, right? We haven't, we haven't prioritized biodiversity upon earth and we haven't um, grown or engaged in a sustainable way. And hopefully there's pockets of it. There's pockets of great things going on. And hopefully we can make those pockets into huge areas of greatness. And hopefully you can be the leader for that. And I'm really excited to hear you do that. And I love, I absolutely love it when students come back to TASM and tell me that they're doing something about this. 
students, this is a really long video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, peace out. Take care.